Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and we're going to be continuing with our lecture on the theory of plate tectonics. So we're going to begin looking at some of the evidence which was used to propose the theory of plate tectonics or more accurately continental drift which is what it was called at the time. So the first piece of evidence that was used as the porter is something which is referred to as the jigsaw fit. So there's actually a very good chance that you spotted this when you were in high school. You were probably taking a geography class, you had a textbook in front of you, and in that textbook you probably had a map of the world. And one of the things you notice very, very quickly is that if you look at the coastlines of some of the continents, you can see quite easily that they would actually lock together. They would slot into each other a bit like a jigsaw. And so if we look, we have a couple of very obvious examples right here. If we look at the eastern coast of South America there and the western coast of Africa here, you would notice that they would actually slot into each other quite efficiently. The same goes for the northeastern coast of Africa here, sorry, northwestern coast to apologize, of Africa here, and the eastern coast of North America here. Once again, you can see you have this curved shape there and you can see a corresponding shape right there. So they would actually fit together quite nicely as well. And so if you do this with all the continents, you can actually make them fit together to form one large landmass. Now, this jigsaw fit works particularly well for the southern hemisphere continents especially. So if we go onto the next slide, we can see here we have our southern hemisphere continents, Africa, South America, India, Antarctica, Australia, and a few other pieces of crust. And if we take these pieces of crust and we were to take a map and cut them out, we can actually move these land masses around and we can make them fit together really very, very nicely. And so if you actually you know, look at a map of the, uh, the world, you can begin to see things like, you know, the, uh, the eastern coast of Antarctica would actually slot into the southern coast of Australia quite nicely. And so what this would suggest is there's not really much of a chance that the shape of these continents, their coastlines, would just happen to mirror each other. The chances of that happening are relatively low. So we have to come up with another explanation to explain why these coastlines appear to match up so nicely. And the most obvious explanation is that the pieces of crust that we can see here were once joined together. And then at some point, they split apart from each other and then moved to their current positions. But because they were once joined together, the coastlines have a shape or have retained a shape which allows us to slot them back together. So this was the first piece of evidence to, used by Alfred Wegener in 1912 to propose the theory of continental drift. Now it's now called the theory of plate tectonics, but at the time it was called continental drift because the model he proposed was described as being like giant battleships plowing through the oceanic crust, moving all over the surface of the earth. So hence the name continental drift. So the next piece of evidence used by Wegener is fossil evidence. So to begin with, let's think about a situation where the continents have never moved. So they've always been in the position they are now. So we know that due to the position of the continents, they all have their own climatic conditions. And so this means they all have their own distinct environmental conditions. And these environmental conditions are obviously going to affect the types of plants and animals that we find on all the continents. So a good example would be something like an elephant. So we find elephants in Africa and India because conditions are suitable for large herbivores. In contrast, South America, Antarctica and Australia, no elephants because conditions aren't right for them. So this means that if you assume the continents have never moved, you should not see a lot of species shared between very, very disparate environments. So you shouldn't see the same organisms appearing in Antarctica as you get in India, for instance. You know, two completely different continents, two completely different sets of environmental conditions. Therefore, you should get two completely different sets of plants, animals, and also fossils. However, when we look at the fossil record for the Southern Hemisphere continents, we can see that that's not the case. We can see that there are fossils shared between all the continents. The classic example is a tree-like plant called Glossopteris. 
Now, Glossopteris likes, well, liked conditions which were similar to that of modern day Houston. So relatively warm, relatively humid conditions. And we find Glossopteris fossils across all of these Southern Hemisphere continents. We find them in South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, and Australia. The problem is, is that as I've just described, Glossopteris doesn't like extreme conditions. So it wouldn't like the freezing cold of Antarctica and it wouldn't like the very, very hot, dry conditions of Australia. So that doesn't really make any sense, does it? So how could you have a plant existing on all these continents at the same time if the continents were in their current position with their current environmental conditions? It just doesn't work, does it? We also have several other organisms, uh, these in this case uh, animals, which we find on co uh, different continents as well. So in the case of animals, you think to yourself, ah, well, there's an explanation there. They could just migrate. But we've already discussed this in one of the earlier lectures. In order for an animal to migrate between continents, assuming those continents have never moved, would take generations. So it would take thousands of years. There would be multiple evolutionary steps involved. And the animal that arrived would not be the same animal that left the continent, you know, several hundred thousand years ago. So there has to be an explanation to explain why we see the same plants and animals occurring on the Southern Hemisphere continents at the same time. And the only reasonable explanation is that, once again, these pieces of continental crust were once joined together. Because they were once joined together, well, that means they're all going to share the same environmental conditions on a broad scale. And so this means that you can have plants, you know, existing across this entire landmass. And so in the fossil record, we'll see the same plant occurring in the rocks on all of these continents. The fact that we also have the continents joined together means the animals can just simply migrate from one continent to another without having to go on some absolutely huge, you know, gigantic journey that takes, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Instead, they could probably walk it in a few days. So instantly, this also helps to back up the idea that the continents were once joined together as one landmass. The next piece of evidence is glacial evidence. So this, this is the effects of glaciers on rocks. So if we look, we can see an area that's been affected by glaciation. So the first thing you'll notice is the soil is very, very thin. It gets scraped off by the glacier. So think of the glacier as a giant bulldozer. As the glacier moves across the terrain, it strips off all the soil. It strips off all the loose rock. And what gets exposed is the bedrock, the solid rock underground. And then the glacier will simply flow across the top of the bedrock. Now, as the glacier moves across it, the glacier actually polishes the bedrock because the ice isn't just ice. It's a mixture of ice and bits of rock. And so as this mixture of ice and rock moves across the bedrock, it's actually like taking a piece of sandpaper to a piece of wood. You know, the longer the ice moves across it, the smoother the rock will become. And you can see this rock has been smoothed by glacial processes. In fact, it's referred to as glacially smoothed rock. The other thing you'll notice is that there are lots and lots of scratches on this rock. These in geology are referred to as striations and they're grooves which get cut into the bedrock as large pebbles get dragged over the bedrock. Okay, so the rock gets polished by very, very small pebbles, you know, sand sized material trapped in the bottom of the ice. These striations are being cut by cobble and pebble sized pieces of rock which are stuck in the ice and they're cutting these grooves as they get dragged across it. Now, these striations are very, very helpful to geologists because they show us which way the ice was moving. And so we can use these striations to say, right, the ice was going in this direction. Therefore, it started over there and it, you know, and it, and it, fl and it moved downhill that way. So we know which way the ice is going, courtesy of the striations. Now, the other thing that glaciers will do is they will deposit a very, very distinctive type of rock, which is called a glacial till. And if we look here, you can kind of see what a glacial till would look like. It's very, very rich in pebbles. So it has a big range of clasts going from very, very small clay sized clasts all the way up to giant boulders. And you can see it consists of all these large clasts and all these large clasts are separated by a very muddy, fine grained matrix. 
okay so you have these big pieces of rock which are sitting in a material which is dominated by clay and silt and it's a very very distinctive rock so what do we see well we can see that we have our once again our southern hemisphere continents africa south america india australia and antarctica and at the same time they all show signs of having been covered by giant glaciers now once again think about it if these continents were in their current positions and had never moved that's going to be pretty difficult to do so think about it straight away the environmental conditions are going to be a problem australia is well known for being pretty hot and pretty dry same goes for india relatively warm climate same goes for africa relatively warm climate and also to be fair quite large parts of south america as well so the chances of you being able to form large ice sheets on those continents if they are in their current position and have their current environmental conditions are relatively low you also need to explain how this ice sheet was forming at the same time so in order to explain that if the continents were in their current positions and they had never moved you would have to say okay the entire southern hemisphere was one huge sheet of ice which went over the oceans so it probably started in antarctica it spread out and it extended onto all of these southern hemisphere continents and that is a pretty spectacularly large ice sheet could it be done yes is it would it be very difficult to do yes so the chances of there having been a very very large ice sheet that managed to cover all the southern hemisphere continents at the same time is relatively low however if we use a model where we say all the southern hemisphere continents were moving together as one big landmass because they were joined together and that landmass just happened to move across the south pole so it got very very cold well then we could have a very very large ice sheet forming that would be able to extend over all of these continents and this ice sheet would form at the same time so we will get glacial sediments in the rock record from each of these continents that are of with that are of the same age now the other thing we can do is if we bring the continents back together and make them into one landmass like this and we look at the striations the direction in which the ice was moving we can see similarity so we can see that we have striations which would be coming from antarctica and they would you can know, see the striations would be moving the ice onto australia same on same towards india same towards africa and same towards south america so we know the center of our ice sheet is going to be somewhere around here that's where it started forming and the ice steadily moved out from that central location and we can see that from the striations so all of a sudden once again by bringing the continents together it helps to give us a very very simple explanation to explain why we are seeing these glacial deposits across these widely spaced continents and these glacial deposits are all of the same age if we just say the continents were all joined together then all of a sudden that explanation becomes very very simple and this is often referred to as the glacial fit or the glacial model so we can see that based on the three pieces of evidence the jigsaw fit the fossil fit and the glacial fit that we have a reasonably strong body of evidence to suggest that the continents were once joined together and that they have migrated to their current positions however it wasn't universally agreed on that that theory was correct and so the question is well what were the problems that were proposed with the theory of continental drift so the first problem that Wegener had is he couldn't explain the mechanism so he said okay we have evidence that shows the continents were joined together and this evidence would suggest that at some point they split apart and they migrated to their current positions however it doesn't explain why they moved what was the power source that was actually doing the moving it's like you getting in your car you driving somewhere and you not knowing that the, you know the car is being powered by the internal combustion engine you know the car started somewhere you know the car finished somewhere so it's moved from one place to another but you don't know why 
So one of the problems is you have to be able to explain why something is happening. It's not just enough to have the evidence. And so obviously we know that Alfred Wegener proposed this uh, theory of constant drift in 1912, but it wasn't until 1966 that a complete mechanism to explain why and how the continents were actually moving was actually put forward and universally accepted. So it took you know 50 plus years for people to actually be able to come up with the mechanism for continental drift. Another problem that we had when Wegener proposed the theory in 1912 is that many geologists had a lack of familiarity with data from the Southern Hemisphere. So you have to remember at this point in time, most geologists were situated in Europe, North America, or Asia, particularly Russia. And so this is a, a bit of a problem. You know, you had a whole group of geologists that were very familiar with Northern Hemisphere geology, but they were pretty unfamiliar with Southern Hemisphere geology. And so when Wegener walks in and goes, I've got all this wonderful data, but it's all from the Southern Hemisphere continents, a lot of them went and said, yeah, I suppose that could work, but we don't trust the data because we're not familiar with it. We don't know how to interpret it properly. And so both of these reasons, the, the lack of a mechanism and the lack of familiarity, were initially used as points of attack against Wegener's theory of continental drift, which we now call plate tectonics. Now, over time, we've managed to uh, explain away the mechanism. So we now know, or at least we believe we have a good explanation as to what the mechanism is. And now most geologists are relatively familiar with both Northern and Southern Hemisphere geology. So this lack of familiarity has been on the whole also overcome. So now the theory of continental drift or more accurate theory of plate tectonics is pretty much a universally accepted geologic model. Okay, thanks for watching everybody and take care.